Hello, everyone. I welcome you all to this session of a medallion lecture. Each year, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics nominates eight medallion lectures in fields uh, across its subject range. The award of a medallion signals the honor inherent in being selected to give one of these lectures. Professor Gerard Benarus, the IMS is awarding you a medallion lecture this year. Congratulations you. to you on this occasion. Thank you so much. Professor Benarus earned his PhD from the University of Paris 7 in 1981 under the supervision of Robert Asenkopf. He has held faculty positions in France and Switzerland and has been at the Courant Institute since 2002. He was its director between 2011 and 2016. Professor Benarus's research spans probability theory and its applications from physics to machine learning and have industrial applications. Notable areas that he has touched are stochastic analysis, large deviations, random media and random matrices, dynamics of spin glasses, statistical mechanics of disordered media, and hypoelliptic operators and heat kernels. He has received several prestigious awards and honors. Allow me to mention a few of these. He is the recipient of the Rollo Davison Prize from the Imperial College London and the Montreal Prize from the French Academy of Sciences. He has been a plenary speaker at the European Congress of Mathematics and an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians. He's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and is an elected member of the International Statistical Institute, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Last but not the least, he became a member of the National Academy of Sciences USA in 2020. Professor Benarus, I now invite you to present your medallion lecture, Random Determinants and the Elastic Manipulation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Bo. So I'll speak about this uh, topic, which belongs to statistical physics, but uses a lot of random matrices. It's a joint, a recent joint work with my colleague Paul Bourgat at Courant and, and Ben McKenna, a finishing PhD student. Uh, and so let me uh, start with what is this talk about? So I re report on this recent joint works. We compute in this work what is called the topological complexity of the elastic manifold in what is called the mezard parisi limit, which is, has been proposed at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And if you are interested in this talk, the paper is accessible on archive. It was posted uh, two months ago. The, so what is topological complexity? You will see that we are looking at the Hamiltonian of a, of a large system, which is a random function. And this function, a smooth function, and we will see that this function is very complex topologically. That is, it has, a, 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 could be very complex and could have, depending on the parameters, very many critical points and a, a complicated structure. We will, in fact, by doing this, we will confirm the very recent work by Jan Fyodorov and Pierre Le Dussel a year ago about what is called the topological trivialization. This work is by Fyodorov and Le Dussel, is of course a work in physics. We essentially, and the conjecture, what we are gonna prove. And um, so what we do is we compute this topological complexity. Don't, don't, of course, I will come back to what all that means using the, the classical catch thrice formula. And this brings us into the world of random matrix theory. Katz Rice is in fact a dictionary between problems of uh, random topology and problems of random matrix theory. So what random matrix theory, RMT, will contribute here is to give us the asymptotics of certain random determinants at the core of the proof. And we will need to have the asymptotic, the exponential asymptotics, and that is the asymptotics of the log of the determinant, and we will need to be able to do that for complicated random determinant, non-invariant one, not the usual one belonging to RMT, like the GOE or the GUE or things of that nature. Things where the, the random matrix model is not invariant under usual groups. And so we do that. So this is the, the other paper, this, in this other paper, which was posted essentially at the same time in much broader settings that what we need here, where we study directly this pure random matrix theory question. And so here's the reference if you're interested. So here's a map of the talk. 
we, I start by introducing the model, the disordered elastic media, or what is called the elastic manifold. I will summarize quickly our results on the complexity of the elastic manifold. Then I will state the result precisely. Then I will give you a proof strategy, nothing fancy here. Then I will come, of course, to the background tools that are needed in the proof, like the complexity of general random functions of many variables and the catchphrase formula. I will spend a little time on the role of isotropy or the complexity of those functions, and then go to this technical part on random determinant. Okay, so that's the map of the talk, if I have time for that. So first, what is the model? Disordered elastic media or the elastic manifold? So here is a quotation from Yamarki which has many seemingly different ranging systems ranging from magnet to superconductors with extremely different microscopic physics share the same ingredient and can be described under the unifying concept of disordered elastic media, such as an interface between um, regions of opposite magnetization in magnetic system is subjected to the effects of disorder ex existing in, in the material. A specially interesting feature of all these systems is that these disordered elastic structures can be set in motion by applying an external force on them and that the motion will be drastically affected by the presence of disorder. What properties result from the competition between elasticity and disorder is an extremely complicated problem which constitute the essence of the physics of disordered elastic media. So for those of you who've worked on this type of physics thing, when you see physicists saying that something is extremely complicated, usually you shy away. We, we came to this problem because of the, of the work of, of uh, Jan Fyodorov and uh, Pierre Le Dussal, which we could kind of understand. Uh, so here's the model. Let me start with the, the model as physicists or mathematicians, PDE people would ask it. So in the continuum. So consider an op open subset of Rd, omega, and then define the following energy function on the space of smooth function, u, which are defined on Rd with value in Rn. So remember those two numbers, d and n. So h of u, this energy function, all this Hamiltonian, if you want, is just the h1 norm, the integral of grad u square, plus the integral of v of x and u of x, where v is in fact a smooth potential. It may depend on the location x and on the field u. So that's the model, basically. Here, cl very classically, this is a very old problem going to the 19th century. You could ask about the minimization problem. Find the u's minimizing h of u under some reasonable boundary condition on the boundary of omega. So that's not what we'll do directly here. We'll Try to understand the topology of this minimization problem, if you will. So the model here includes two integers, d, which is called the internal dimension, and n, which is the dimension of the field. And then, of course, you also have the open set omega and the potential v. So that's a very, very general problem in elasticity. What the specific part here is, we will start by a confining potential, like v is uh, has a some harmonic potential, the, the u of x squared. And then you add disorder. The disorder Vn here is a random potential which depends on the position and on the value of the field. So for simplicity, we will assume that Vn is Gaussian. That's always simplifying, that it's smooth and centered because that would not change much. We will assume that its covariance is isotropic and also fast decorrelation in X. So a random potential in a decent class. Okay, so here is the Hamiltonian we have. I, I added parameters here, A and B, temporary parameters, to be able to think that you can change the different effects here of the different terms. Here we have three terms. The first term, which is the elastic term. This first term, if you minimize it, you want the function U to be flat, right? Having a small H1 norm means you want the function to be flat, that the elasticity effect. The second term, the L2 norm, wants the function to be close to zero. That's some form of pinning. And then, so all these two terms are kind of very simple. The third term is the one we like as probabilists or statisticians. The third one adds disorder and complexity because the third one is random and could be terrible. So in order to study this problem, we first discretize it. We, 
Okay, so now let's consider to simplify. Let's consider the set omega to be a cube. We describe it in the discretize it in a discrete box. One l to the d. This is the third important parameter. L is the size of the box, and then our Hamiltonian becomes this: the integral of grad u square becomes this sum of u of x minus u of y square, indicator of x neighbor to y. That what this means, plus the L two norm plus the random noise, the random field, and Vn isotropic smooth Gaussian field. Okay, so that's the Hamiltonian we want to study in a discrete context. And remember, we have three parameters, d, the internal dimension, n, the dimension of the field, and l, the size of the system, the size of the box. So the, 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 the Hamiltonian can be rewritten. And physicists would rewrite it like this. It's just a very simple algebra here. You know, this norm square here, this difference of norm square, you can, of course, write it like this. So here you would have the identity times minus the discrete Laplacian. And mu zero and t zero are two free parameters. They are easily computed from my parameters a and b. So that's the way physicists would write the, the problem. That's exactly the same. Mu zero here is called the mass. That was what corresponded to the L2 norm. So that's something that want, the, the higher the mass, the flatter the system, if you want. The, the, the T0, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the closer to zero. T0 is the elasticity constant. And delta here is the periodic lattice Laplacian. V again is a centered smooth isotropic function. And, for the, and I write what its covariance would be. The covariance between XU and YV would be this formula. So this n here is just for normalization things. This Dirac mass here means that when x and y are different, the correlation is zero. So the, the noise at two different locations is IID. And now at one given location, the noise as a function of v is a function of the norm u minus v. And this function, I call it b, right? So the disorder, as I said, is assumed to be IID in x and isotropic in the field. The function b, in fact, we know that since Schoenberg in 38, so that's not recent, has to be of a certain form. That, and the form is this, where nu here is a finite positive measure. That's a basic theorem of, of, on what can be a covariance as a function of the norm. So this is well known. And we assume here b to be smooth, four times differentiable, which ensures that our vn is at least c2 and then and avoid degeneracies. So our uh, noise is smooth in you. Okay. All right. So that's the model. Here it is again described here. That's the model we want to understand. This is the random function. This function is random because Vn is random, of course. All right. So this model. Let's look at it, at this discrete model in spatial cases. Let's look first at the case where L is one, which means your box has signs one, which means you have only one site. So when L is one or equivalently when the dimension is zero, that's the way physicists said, we have only one site. And so we have no interaction. So the model we have now is just the random potential percent L2 norm. The model is just a soft spin glass in the harmonic potential. That's what it is. So it's not a spin glass as a, in a spherical model because it's a priori defined uh, on the full space, but it's, but it's a spin glass in a harmonic potential. And if you look at it like this, then the general model is a system of L to the D disordered model like spin glasses with an elastic interaction, which wants to make them almost equal, we wants to make them flat. That's a way to think about this model. Then here's another case, very different. You take d equal one, the internal dimension equal one and l going to infinity and n is fixed. Then what you have is h of u has this shape again. And when you study it, when l goes to infinity, this is a version of the directed polymer in a random potential, right? If you take exponential of this, if you took the Gibbs measure associated with this uh, random Hamiltonian, the exponential of the first term will give you exactly a random walk Right? This would be a pinning potential, and this is the random potential. So this is something which is, you know, goes in the direction of KPZ or things like this. In particular, the complexity of this model, when D is N is 1, and L goes to infinity, has been studied in depth by physicists, by Fyodor Fredoussal, Alberto Rousseau, and Texier in, I mean, three years ago. But, 
Okay. You have other models which are very, this elastic manifold model is very wide and it covers many models of random interfaces. Now it's when n is equal to d plus one. So when the, the internal dimension is the dimension of the field minus one, and when the size of the model goes to infinity. We, will, we won't study this. We will, not, we will not look yet at least at either of these cases, but rather at a hard problem which has been defined 30 years ago by Mesa and Parisi and uh, another limit. And this other limit is Marc Mizar and Giorgio Parisi studied it when the dimension D is fixed, when L is fixed, but when the dimension of the field goes to infinity. And this is what we're gonna do. So this problem was studied massively first, in fact, by Fisher and Fisher in 86, then Mizar Parisi, and more recently by uh, by Dussal, Muller, and Wies, and this paper by Fyodora Folna Dussal for a result which really started our work. Okay, so let's now that the problem is given, let's look at what the um, uh, what what we prove. So I will first give you what we prove in a summary. So what we first prove is we compute the annealed topological complexity of this Hamiltonian again in the limit when n goes to infinity and the n are, are fixed. That is, we compute the, the logarithmic behavior of the average number of critical points and of local minima of this Hamiltonian. So we ask ourselves, how many critical points does, does this smooth Hamiltonian has, have and how many local minima? This annealed complexity problem, so it's called annealed because we compute the logarithm of the average, is given by a very complicated variational problem, which we do solve by a miracle. And solving this problem, we see a sharp transition between two regions, They're depending on the parameters. Our parameters here, remember, are mu zero and T zero, the mass and the elasticity. So we have a region of positive exponential complexity. That is a region where the number of critical points and the number of local minima is exponentially large in N. So this function is extremely rough, extremely complex. And then there is another region where the complexity is vanishing and the, the function is no longer complex. And so we have here a transition which is usually called in physics topological trivialization. You have a region where the topology of the landscape is very complicated and a region where, where it's trivial. And for that to happen, you need high enough mass, okay? Or to have the, uh, the uh, vanishing complexity. So we understand this transition at the critical, what is called Larkin mass from the name of the physicist who started this question of elasticity a long time ago. And the result confirmed the recent work by Fyodorov and Dussal. So that's what we do. What we do not do yet, that's the optimistic part. So we do not compute yet the quench topological complexity. That means computing not the logarithm of the expectation, but the expectation of the logarithm, which is usually much harder. The, then the, what we do here, this complexity question is a zero temperature question. That is, it says something about the shape of the Hamiltonian, of the function. We could, of course, and that's the natural thing to do, study the Gibbs measure now defined by this Hamiltonian. So exponential minus beta, this Hamiltonian normalized. We do not yet do that because that would be a question at positive temperature. How does this complexity of the function influence the behavior of the Gibbs measure at positive temperature? Can we understand the phase transition for the Gibbs measure using this complexity approach, which has been done in other models? And we do not study yet the effect that was mentioned in the quotation by Giamarchi, that is the effect of a force to get a pinning, what physicists call pinning, deep pinning transition from this random manifold. And what he was mentioning about the effect of disorder pinning this random interface. And of course, we even less understand how deep pinning would happen dynamically. The question he was asking here was static, it was about equilibrium. Understanding the dynamics at high enough force would, would also be hard and, and very interesting. And least, last but not least, we do not yet study the other limits, not the one when the Mésard-Parisi limits, but the other limits I was mentioning. So there is a lot 
for those who are interested in this topic and who want to try to help us in this enterprise. So let me state our, our result properly now. So let me call n tot, the total number, that's what tot means, of, of the, all critical points of the elastic manifold Hamiltonian, H of u. Then what we prove is that the annealed complexity, so the limit of one over n L to the D, logarithm of this expectation of the total number is given by a certain formula. Sigma is a function that I will describe. It's a formula of three things, the three important parameters, mu zero, the mass, that's the strengths of the elastic, uh, of the L2 norm, I'm sorry. T zero is the elastic constant, the strengths of the H1 norm. And four, B second of zero is in fact the strength of the noise. It's the variance of the noise, if you, if you remember the formula. So that's the strength of the noise, the elastic constant and the mass. Okay. Similarly, if now I call NM like number of minima, local minima, then we also have the same formula. The, we have an explicit formula, and now I call it sigma min of these three things. And this function sigma and sigma min are explicit. So we have a complete explicit formula for this no, top, I mean, number of local minima. So here is, are these explicit formula. They are a bit painful. So consider the, so first we look at the following real symmetric matrix, mu zero times the identity minus T zero times the discrete Laplacian. Very simple matrix with mu zero on the diagonal, negative T zero around the, the diagonal, right? So it's a real symmetric matrix of size L to the D. And I call it D and it depends on the two constants. And then I can look at its spectral measure, which I call mu, which is one over L to the D, sum of the Dirac masses at the eigenvalues. Of course, the eigenvalues of the discrete Laplacian on a large cube, here we use periodic boundary condition, are extremely easy. We all know them. And finally, I will need the notation sigma B is the semicircle measure of radius two square or root of B, right? The usual semicircle that always comes up in, in random matrices. So with this notation, here's the variational formula. Sigma is given by minus one over L over L to the D log of the determinant of this deterministic matrix plus a soup. And note that this soup is over R. It's a one dimensional soup, no, so not too hard. Soup over U of integral of log of lambda minus U, the logarithmic potential of the following measure, sigma B plus mu, this mu is the, the spectral measure of the, uh, of the Laplacian, minus a constant u square over 2b. And what is this 2b? This plus, of course, is the free additive convolution. All right, so two things to notice here. We have a free additive convolution coming, and we have a soup, a variational problem in R. Okay, for the sigma min, we have a similar problem, except here we replace the soup but the soup over u less than L, where L is the left hand of the support of the free convolution. So that's a complicated formula, which I don't expect you to swallow just by looking at it. But you see that it's uh, an explicit formula, except that the soup here has not been computed. But then I tell you the soup is in fact computed in the paper. This the supremum is computed. It's a little bit of a pain, so I don't, I don't show it, but it can be computed explicitly. So now let's go to the transition. That's what we want, the phase transition. We have this formula. What can we do with it? So we look at topological trivialization above the Larkin mass. We define mu c, the Larkin mass, to be the solution of this equation. Again, this equation is not random. This is the empirical measure of the discrete Laplacian. All that is purely deterministic. So it's an explicit formula, which gives you a mu c, a critical value. And then the important result comes here. When the mass is larger than mu c, both the total and the minima complexity vanish, which means and that a large enough mass kills the exponential complexity of the landscape. Right? So we, we know that the landscape is not complex when the mass is larger than mu c. Of course, we could also have phrased this differently by saying that the complexity vanish when the noise level B, which is four B second of zero, is lower than some critical noise level. So either when the mass is large or when the noise is small, the landscape is not complex. Moreover, when you are below the lock-in mass, we can prove that both annealed complexity are positive, and as I said, explicit. 
So saying that they're exp exp uh, positive means that the mean number of local minima, for instance, is exponentially large. So the, the system tends to be very complex. So indeed, this supremum, as I said, is achieved at an explicit V, you can compute it. In fact, for the minima complexity, the minimum is achieved at the left end of the support. Okay, so now that we understand this transition, we can be more ambitious and try to understand what's happening at criticality. So here I express it in terms of the noise level. At criticality, when you approach the noise, the critical level from above, so you, you start in the phase where the system is complex and you go to a system which is not complex. You look at the, the complexity and it should vanish. And what we prove is that it vanishes quadratically. So it vanishes like B minus BC square times a constant and then a smaller order term. And when you look at the complexity of the minima, it vanishes cubically. And this is what we prove to. This, these two exponents, two and three, are what physicists really wanted to see. And this is what we prove here. This is in a certain class, a classical class of, of uh, phase transitions. All right, so we have a complete picture in some sense, very far from complete, of course, because I gave you a list of questions we can't answer, but at least for the complexity, we have a region of positive complexity where, where the noise is large, a region of uh, zero co vanishing complexity when noise is small, and we understand the, the transition. Okay, so how do we prove that? So um, the proof strategy is simple. We want to compute a complexity, so we apply Katz Rice's formula. I will recall it below. That's what Katz Rice formula does. And in order to use catch rice formula, you have to com compute the distribution of the Hessian of our function at a point conditioned by the fact that this point is critical. That's doable. I say easy. Let's say it's doable because our function is Gaussian. So computing conditioned uh, distribution for Gaussian is doable. It's linear algebra. Then the reduces our whole thing to a a question about random determinant, the, the, the determinant of this Hessian condition. So we have to understand the random determinant of this matrix, very large matrix, and it's we will see it's a block structure Gaussian matrix. So it's an it's not a classical random matrix. Mm -hmm. It's not at all a GOE or anything like that. It's not invariant. And so understanding in detail its determinant is not completely easy, hence the second paper. Once we have the understanding of this random determinant, we apply a Laplace formula, and then we get naturally with a Laplace formula, we get a variational formula on R to the L to the D. So that's super heavy. And if we had been stuck here, we would probably not be able to say anything about the variational formula. But this variational problem in a high dimension can be simplified to the problem I mentioned above on R which is really a miracle. There is an unexpected convexity, which I, of course, which we proved, but which I, up to now, I, I still understand why it's there. And so once we have this miracle, we can recognize the variational problem as related to the problem in D equals zero, as I mentioned above, that is for one point. This problem at one point now will also be a spin glass model. It will be a soft spin, but not like before a soft spin glass in an isotropic potential, it will be a soft spin glass in an anisotropic random potential. And so we have to understand this one. So we understand this spin glass problem, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you below. And from there, we deduce all the results of the topological complexity and the topolo topological transition that I mentioned for the elastic manifold. So that's the nature of the proof. So now I take a, a breather and come back. So the, essentially at this point, I've given you our results uh, first in, in a summary, then in detail, and then told you how we are supposed to prove it. Uh, and now I, I, I dive into the tools for the proof. So the first tool of course is the Katz-Rice formula. Katz-Rice formula, the, which is, uh, of course started in dimension one, started in, in statistics, in fact, in electrical engineering for Rice and then extended by Katz, essentially because Katz had problems in dimension two coming from complex analysis. 
And this goes back, I mean, Rice did it during the, the first world war, the second world war, essentially, so a long time ago. And recently we have been applying the Katz-Rice formula in diverging dimensions. So let me explain what that is. Let's consider a smooth function f on a compact manifold m of large dimension n. Assume that every critical point is non-degenerate, just to simplify matters, so that the function is what is called a Morse function. Then the function has a finite number of critical points if you are on a compact thing. And then you want to count this number of critical points. And you may want also to count the number of critical points of, let's say, a given index. For instance, you may want to count the number of local minima, which means index equals zero. You may also want to fix a range for the critical values, not the critical points. So all that can be done. And in particular, in the context of statistical mechanics, F will be an energy or Hamilt energy or Hamiltonian, like our function H. And we want to count the number of local minima, typically with low values, because they are the ones that are important at low temperature. Of course, in, in, in regimes for, let's say, high dimensional statistics, F could, for instance, be a log likelihood. And then you could try to apply the same thing. And of course, it has been done in a few problems of high dimensional st statistics. You may be also interested in the topology of the sublevel sets, the sets of X where F is less than U. So let's call crit K the number of critical points. Here is Katz Rice formula of F, the number of critical points of index K. So local minima is zero. And by crit K of F and B, the number of critical points of index K was the value of F in B, where B is a subset of the real line. Assume that F is Gaussian, non-singular and smooth enough. And here's Katz Rice formula. The expectation of this number of critical points is given by an integral on N of two things, AK and phi X of zero. Phi X of U is the density of the law of the Gaussian vector grad F. So phi X of zero is the density at zero of the law of the Gaussian vector, which is natural because you're interested in critical points. And now the important term is this AK. AK is the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of the second derivative of F, the Hessian, indicator of f of x in b, the value in b, indicator that of the index of x at x is k, conditioned by the fact that the point x is critical. So this is the important formula. Here you have a random matrix. Hessian of f is a random real symmetric matrix. It's random because f is random. Large dimensional if n is large. And so what is the random matrix we're interested in? Is the Hessian conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. So that's the link, that's the dictionary between Katz-Rice. I mean, Katz-Rice gives this link between random matrix theory and to random topology, random geometry, computing the, the, the topology of a landscape. All right, so that's where we start. That's what I'm saying, establishes a direct link between complexity and RMT. The, the F defines a, a, a field of real symmetric matrices, as I said, which is the Hessian. And what you have to look at now is the important step is to understand the behavior of the determinant of the Hessian, absolute value, in fact, conditioned by the fact that X is critical. Of course, you could ask yourself, what about non-Gaussian case? An extension of the formula is possible. But of course, when the, the function is non-Gaussian, Computing conditional distribution is pretty hard. So I won't go there. I'm, I'm staying in the Gaussian case where computing conditional distribution is simple. Okay, so here, here's a slide about questions. Let me be critical about the result I gave you. What does the anneal computation that Katz Rice gave you here bring really? Right? What about computing quench complexity? Of course, if you know that you're, you always bound, you always have the Jensen bound relating the log of an expectation and an expectation of a log. So if you know that the, uh, that the, the uh, anneal complexity is less or equal to zero, you know something about the quench complexity, but you don't have usually the other bound. It could be that these two things are different. And what you're really interested in is not the log of the expectation, but the log of the number of critical points. So what about computing quench complexity? So there is a trick in, uh, in, which has been introduced recently in physics, which is called the replicated Katz-Rice method. 
in this paper by Valentina Ross, Giulio Biroli, Chiara Camarota, or all physicists and myself. But this method is good for physics, but not good for mathematics. If you want to be rigorous mathematically, it always, it's always one of those magical things. It gives the right result, but we are far from being able to prove it. If one wants to be rigorous mathematically, for the moment, there is one tool which is rather blunt. It's you can, using catch rights, you can compute higher moments of the number of critical points. And so, for instance, you can compute the second moment. And if the second moment behaves like the first moment square, then maybe you can prove that the quench complexity is equal to the annealed complexity, so that your annealed result is correct. So what we have for now in mathematics is a tool to prove, to compute annealed complexity and then work hard to prove that quench complexity is the same in certain regimes. We don't have any tool for the moment to compute quench complexity outside of this regime. So that's where we are. So in particular, this, compute, this quench computation has been done recently since 2017, the last three, four years, four years, by, uh, for the case of spherical spin glasses in a really beautiful series of work by Eliran Subag. So uh, Eliran was a student of uh, Ofer Zaytouni, then was a postdoc at Courant, and now is a professor at Weizmann. So here is the... So now that, so at this point, we have the tool, we have the cats rife method and the link with random metric theory. Now let me talk about the role of isotropy. You may have asked, why did I assume that the noise had this isotropy property? So one class where the task of understanding cats rice is, is, is done, it's when Gaussian distribution is, uh, is the Gaussian distribution of the function is isotropic. So let me explain what that means. Uh, again, on our Riemannian manifolds, so assume that the Gaussian process F has a covariance, which is random, and this covariance is a function of the distance on the manifold. That's what isotropy means. And this is what we assume for our noise, if you remember. Obviously, this function G of the distance has to be positive definite, so it constrains what the function G can be. That, of course, it also tells you that the variance is constant because the variance is always G of zero. And without loss of generality, you can always assume that the variance is one. So as I said, if the manifold is the unit sphere, such functions have been characterized a long time ago. Here I said 42, but it was 38. And here they are. Those function and the sphere are given by this sum of AP cosine of D to the P. And AP, the important thing, has to be non-negative. And of course, decaying fast enough for this series to converge. So. And so this tells you that the covariance can always be written as a function of the distance. And in fact, you can write it as a function of the inner product. If you just think a moment, these two formula are the same. So here is this class of example that comes from isotropy is in fact exactly the class of what physicists call spherical spin glasses. Here is the function that they define. It's just a sum of square root of AP, which you can because AP is non-negative, HP. And HP is simply a random homogeneous polynomial of degree P. So sum of Xi1, Xip with constants uh, J, I1, Ip. And you assume that the Js are Iid and 0, 1. If you take this random homogeneous polynomial, that's called the pure P spin, you mix them by taking the sum of them, you get the general class of random isotropic Gaussian function on the sphere. There's a huge literature now in physics and not huge, but large mathematical literature on the complexity of these models and on the behavior of Gibbs measure at low temperature. So Fyodorov, Aufinger, myself and Czerny, Subag, whom I already mentioned, Subag and Zaytouni, Aufinger and Gold, etc. The basic first step is the following. In this simple case, the random matrix, this dictionary, brings you to a very simple modification of the GOE, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, which, which of course is the simplest of all random matrices. So the whole arsenal of random matrix theory is accessible, including heavy tools like large deviations. But, so here, let now let me go now, instead of being on the sphere, let me go to an isotropic field spin glass on Rn. So again, I take a random a centered isotropic Gaussian function. As I said, the, the, the covariance has to be of this form, as I mentioned above. 
So now I'm on Rn instead of being on the sphere. And I put it in a harmonic well to come close to our model. So again, it's now the question of just one site. And so this is a soft spin glass in an isotropic well. And again, you can ask the same question about the topological complexity. So the anneal complexity has been studied in depth by Fyodorov in the 2000s. Of course, you could see Mézard and Parisi for a physics motivation. Again, here are the random matrix because of this isotropy. The random matrix is again a simple modification of the GOE. Now, that makes the problem a little harder. And it's not gratuitous. Of course, we need this harder problem. Let me put this same random function, Vn, in an anisotropic well. So instead of having u square here, the L2 norm, I put dn here, a real symmetric positive matrix. So it's really a well, but it's not isotropic. It's anisotropic. Now I go out of the isotropy. So this, is, this could be called a soft spin glass in an anisotropic well. And again, you can ask whether this is a, about the topological complexity of this model. Now, the random matrix, what is it? It's the Hessian of Vn, which is isotropic. So it's related to the GOE. So this term gives us something related to the GOE, but the Hessian of this one is Dn, maybe multiplied by nu. So now we are adding a matrix Dn to a GOE. And thus, thus we are entering the realm of free convolution. In this case, you can accept probably easily that the reason why there is an, a, a free convolution hidden somewhere. So, and we will see the, the real importance of this simple model to understand the elastic manifold if we have time. So in this case, if we assume that the spectral measure of dn converges to some mu d, then we can compute the total complexity. So the one of our analog of the expectation of the number of critical point is given explicitly. And what is this explicit thing? Again, there is a log potential of the, of the mu d, and then here there is again a free convolution. And the reason of the free convolution is the one I gave you. This is the spectral measure of, the, of, the, of d, and this is of course the semicircle coming from the GOE. In fact, this, we have again a, a topological trivialization. In this very simple case, we have vanishing of the complexity for low enough noise and positive complexity above a threshold. So again, we have topological trivialization. All right, we can do the same with, we can understand the transition at criticality. It's again of the same nature. We can understand the complexity of minima and the topological transition is at the same value, but is again cubic. So we have the same phenomenon and the one I gave before. The transition is quadratic for the number of total, the total number of, of critical points and cubic, the number of minima. So understanding the variational pr principle here, uh, given by the, uh, by the function sigma that I described very briefly, is a rather delicate step. And it uses some PDE, uh, Stefan Berger's equation for the semicircle, and a recent delicate inequality, which has been proven by Alice Guillonet and Milen Maida a year ago, for what is called free convolution at the edge, something that comes from the word of free probability. So this is, uh, you know, I'm going fast, but this is, this is the hard part. Now, I conclude with this question. In the end, we have to understand, remember the Katz-Rice formula. Going back to our model, we have to understand an integral of an expectation of a random, the absolute value of a, of a random determinant, which is not isotropic. So let me ask the question generally. Consider a large random real symmetric matrix, Hn. For us, it will be our, our condition Hessian. How can one compute the asymptotics of this determinant? So we want to understand the limit of one over n log of expectation of an absolute value of determinant. And this is of course what katz Rice asks us to do. But here I'm asking the question in, in why generality? Can we understand the exponential behavior of a random determinant? So literature on random determinant in fact have a long, has a long history. I was surprised by that. In fact, there are exact formula for small moments at finite n, which go back to Forte in 51, to Forsyth and Tucky in 52. It was worked also by Rice, the same Rice for the Katz-Rice formula by Nyquist, also a big name, Rice, Riordan, Precopa, and my very good friend, Amir Dembo, who in, now uh, 30 years ago. So, 
when you want to understand what is also known as Gaussian fluctuation of random determinant, and here are a few literature, a, a bit of the literature. You have, of course, old things in 63 by Goodman. You have more recent things by Paul Bogard and Modi, by Paul Bogard, Modi, and Payne, and, and, and in between results by Tao and Vu, Nguyen and Vu, and Bao Pan Zhu, among many others. I just picked the one I, I know. And then you can ask yourself also, for instance, what is the probability that a determinant is zero? That's the singularity probability for Bernoulli or the discrete matrices. This goes back to Komloch in computer in, in combinatorics. And you know, big names again, Kahn, Komloch, and Chemeridi, Tao Vu, Bourguin, Vu and Wood. And more recently, the best results are probably by Konstantin Tikomirov. Okay, so this is just for those who are interested in this very basic question, how does a random determinant behave? But we want more. So we look at our question now a little naively. We want to understand the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant. I can write it as expectation of exponential n of a certain function. What is the function? The, uh, this is simply a right absolute value of the determinant as it's the absolute value of the product. So it's the product of the absolute value of the eigenvalues. I write this as exponential sum of the log of the absolute value. And then I write, so that can be written in terms of the empirical measure, the empirical spectral measure, the lambda i's are the eigenvalues of hn, and mu hn is this empirical spectral measure, and psi is the integral of the log against this. Then of course, this psi of mu hn is just one over n sum of the log of the absolute values of the lambda i's. Since I'm multiplied by n, it becomes the sum of the log. Exponential of that is just the product. So this formula is trivial. So if the empirical spectral measure converges to some deterministic limit, and if it concentrates fast enough, of course you need that because here you have an exponential n. So it has to concentrate faster than n. Then it is tempting to believe that this thing behaves like one over n log of this thing is just psi of mu infinity. This mu of mu hn can, is close to mu psi of mu infinity. And so this be behaves like exponential n psi mu infinity one over n log that gives us this. So it's tempting to believe that. And in fact, it's true, but it looks, it could be true, but it looks like a question of concentration. The question is, do we have fast enough concentration? So this is, I mean, if your HN is sampled from the GOE or LOE or whatever, in fact, we do have concentration easily because we even have a large deviation principle in scale n square. So, Concentration in scale faster than n is clear, but otherwise. So there's a strong literature again on concentration for the spectral measure. For instance, to the semicircle, you could look at Guillaume and Zetouni, Alice and Offer Zetouni, 2000, Bobkov and Goetze and A. Tikomirov, not the same Tikomirov, 2010, Alexander, Bordenav, Caputo and Shafai is 2011 for us. But that's, and then of course, there's another question. The log is not exactly a good function. So maybe there is a singularity at zero or at infinity. Can it be tamed? So here's the first theorem we prove in this. Thing. We just go back. It's a question about concentration. So then what we do is we use Talagrand's result. Imagine that your matrix is a function of IID random variables, of independent random variables. Then we have this result, the result we want, exactly the, as I stated it, as long as the following conditions are satisfied. Very abstract. The x are independent. The function phi is nice. Mu infinity is a nice measure, and there, and, and there is a, and mu h n converges to it fast enough. And we have very coarse bounds to exclude the very large and very small eigenvalues because of the singularity of the log. And the spectrum is stable when the x i's are truncated. So these are this is of course a kind of very abstract result. It becomes interesting when you can apply it. So to prove it, you simply go back to basics and use Talagrand's result on concentration for product measures. I won't even spend time on that. But it allows us to cover many cases. So here's what we can do for instance. We have the result. Uh, so here I add an E here, which just so that I'm talking here about the characteristic polynomial, but it's of course the same problem. We have it when we have a Wigner matrix with two plus epsilon finite moments, which is near optimal because at two, the determinant, the expectation of the determinant would be infinity anyway. So this is a near optimal. We could take sample covariance matrices. 
with two plus epsilon finite moment, your optimal again. We can take an erdos rainy graph when the uh, parameter is slightly above one over n. And we can take a free addition model, a n plus orthogonal b n a n star, o n star. Of course, here the mu infinity, this limiting is the one you can guess in the Wiener, Wiener matrix in the semicircle. And the sample covariance matrix is, of course, the Pesto Marchenko, etc. So this applies to the Wigner case. And just to show that our abstract theorem applies, I list here what you have to do. For the assumption E that I needed is given by, by the paper by Tikomirov. A condition C is a consequence of work by Nguyen. Condition S for, followed from arguments of Bordenay, Caputo, and Shafa using Bennett's inequality. So what I'm saying here that our abstract nonsense theorem is in fact useful once you put in it uh, the what random matrix theory has given us recently. Okay, so this result, this theorem is based on product measure concentration results of telegraph and it's designed for minimal assumption. We have another general theorem which uh, with a different and easier proof for matrices which are whose linear statistics are already known to concentrate at speed faster than n. For instance, because you have a gromov milman concentration on groups or you have a log Sobolev inequality. In this case, the second case allows us to understand many other cases. And for instance, Gaussian block matrices, which is the case we need for the, um, for the uh, elastic manifold problem. So here's the result that we, and I will conclude with that. Assume that there exists a sequence of deterministic probability measure mu n with a nice density, such that the, the expectation of the spectral measure is close to mu n, and that the linear statistics, one over n trace of f of h n for a large class of f, concentrates fast enough. Then we have the result that the limit of what we want here, one over n log of the expectation of the, pro, the absolute value of the determinant, minus the interval of log L against this mu n goes to zero. So you see here, we don't have a limit theorem directly. We have the fact that we have this contiguous thing. We, we say, if we have mu n that satisfy this, then we can replace our problem here by just understanding the mu n. So this theorem is valid, for instance, when HN is Gaussian, but not GOE, not IID entries with a certain covariance profile, or Ga Gaussian with a good block structure, for instance, this one, and this is what we will use. And here, the only question is, how do you find the mu n in those cases? And the mu n comes from a whole chapter of random matrix theory, which is called MDE, the matrix Dyson equation, which has been developed recently by Erdős, uh, Laszlo Erdős, of course, in Vienna and his collaborators. And so we've been, at some point, we've been helped by the Vienna team and we could adapt their, their work to do that for the case we want, which is the elastic manifold. In particular, the matrix has K blocks. You look at this solution for those who want to try, and here is how you choose the mu n. It's the mu n which, whose Tetris transform is given by that. So this is purely technical. Let's forget that. So with this theorem, we can understand the, uh, the asymptotics of the determinant of our Hessian and thus prove, use the Cassarice formula to prove our complexity results. And I will stop there. Thank you, uh, Gerard, for that uh, wonderful uh, exposition of your recent work. And uh, I invite questions from the audience. Any questions, comments? The, the talk was very clear, so I suppose uh, okay. uh, that's one of the reasons there are no questions here. Okay, in that case, uh, let us all thank uh, Professor Benarus for his uh, wonderful talk, and I conclude this session. Thank you so much. Thank you.